Hello, I'm State Senator Hoon Young Hapgood, and welcome to another edition of the Hapgood Hour, my monthly cable show that brings the people of the 8th District news and views from Lansing. As always, please feel free to contact my office with any questions or concerns that you may have regarding state government. You can give us a call, you can write us a letter, or send us an email, and we'll do our best uh, to respond to your concerns. Uh, today's topic is a very important topic. We're going to be talking about the November ballot here in 2014 and just talk about it generally, um, think about some of the things that, that voters can expect to see and, and be concerned about as they go in and exercise uh, their rights. So uh, today's topic is, is absolutely nonpartisan. We're not telling anyone how to vote on anything, but just giving you some background information so that you can uh, make an informed decision um, in November. So I'm very pleased to be joined by uh, Judy Cardin Jeff with the League for, of Women Voters of Michigan. She's the Vice President of Advocacy. And Craig Thiel, who's uh, with the Citizens Research Council, uh, Senior Research Associate. So very pleased to have both of you on today's show. Thank you for appearing. And why Thank don't you, you just tell us uh, a little bit about yourself and your organization. I'm serving on the state board with the League of Women Voters as a volunteer. Uh, we are a statewide organization as well as a national organization, and we have about 20 local chapters throughout the state. Uh, we are a nonpartisan political organization. We never support or oppose candidates, but we do provide a lot of information, especially at election time, on the candidates and some background information as well as their question and answers for our voter guide. And we also take positions on issues after we've had a study and then do advocacy only in selected areas. Very good, thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you for having us. I appreciate the opportunity. I'm with the Citizens Research Council, as you mentioned. And the Citizens Research Council's been uh, in existence for almost 100 years now. Uh, we were formed during the uh, progressive movement of the beginning of the early part of the 20th century when government was uh, riff with spoil systems and uh, not very uh, professional. And organizations like the CRC grew up to help inform uh, the policy making to make it a little more professional, government a little bit, a little bit more professional. So CRC's kind of served a purpose in providing elected officials with objective, nonpartisan uh, information as they develop public policy. And our, our mission really is to improve the policy uh, that's developed, whether it's at the state level, local level, school district, what have you. And we do that primarily through our research. Uh, we uh, do in-depth uh, research reports, uh, policy briefs, and uh, we'll, we'll post to our, our blog as well on uh, timely, relevant uh, policy matters. And uh, all of our research is available free uh, of charge at our website, which is uh, www.crcmich.org. And I'd encourage all your um, viewers, all the viewers, to, to tune in and uh, get on our mailing list to receive our, our publications. Uh, what we do, I think, is uh, provide that research. What we don't do is we don't tell people, uh, policymakers, how to vote. Uh, we, we will make recommendations, but ultimately it's uh, incumbent upon legislators, policymakers, in, in the case of uh, when citizens serve that role, uh, like they will uh, in November here on some of the ballot questions, to inform their, their decisions. But we won't be telling them how to vote, uh, yes or no, whether it's a, a question on wolf hunting or a, a constitutional amendment. So we guard our nonpartisan uh, objective uh, reputation very, very closely, very tightly. Well, we, we once again, we appreciate both of your organizations uh, being on the show, and, and it really is about empowering voters and letting them uh, get to the ballot and, and make good decisions so that together as a state we, we can move forward. And so what, what, why don't we just start off with uh, you, Judy, and, and just could you tell us some of the basics, some of the things that, um, you know, if, if we voted, you know, once a month or once a week, right. it would, would be, would, you know, we wouldn't even have to think about. But, but sometimes, you know, we vote every two years or every four years. Mm -hmm. and, and so just what are some of the things 
to think about as we approach the, the November election day? What we discover is a lot of people aren't sure whether or not they're registered. Uh, they may, and or if they're registered at their current address is also another question that comes up. And there is a good website with the state, uh, with michigan.gov slash SOS. Um, or vote, either one would work. And you put in your address and it tells you if you're registered here in the state. You can also put in your driver's license number. So you can check and make sure you're registered and you know where your polling place is easily. Um, if you're not registered, you have only until October 6th uh, to register to vote before the November election, a month before. And, uh, but there are other ways uh, for you to be involved besides going to your polling place, and that's to get an absentee ballot. And that, that also has some deadlines, but you can request an ba absentee ballot from now until uh, Saturday, November 4th, just bef I mean, November 2nd, just before the election on Tuesday, November 4th. Um, Whoop, I think I gave the wrong date, so let me correct that. It's Saturday, November 1st, prior to the Tuesday, November 4th general election. And there are a variety of ways for you to request the absentee ballot, but the major things are you have to be over 60 or unable to attend, to go to the polling place for some reason, or you're going to be out of town. There are a few other uh, requirements, but that's those are if you can meet one of those major three, you'll be able to obtain an absentee ballot. And you can get um, you can go to your clerk's office and get an absentee ballot anytime now they're available. Um, you just need to, if you go to your clerk's office, you are going to have to now show a photo ID. And there's been some confusion about that, but that is required if you show up. And the two that are most accepted are your driver's license or a state ID with your photo on, on it. Uh, there are also, you can also send in a form and request the absentee ballot be mailed to you. And you can get that form usually on the website at the clerk's office or again from the Secretary of State's office. So those are some of the important background pieces. Are there questions? Now, now what, what are, from a very sort of broad overview, what's on the ballot? What are people going to okay. be voting on? What offices? Well, when you go to vote, you're able to vote from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. on Tuesday, November 4th. And there are, it's a long list. Um, we have the congressional districts are up. Um, we have the governor and the lieutenant governor. Uh, we have the secretary of state, the attorney general, your U.S. Senate, your U.S. representative, the state board of education, University of Michigan, the state, Michigan State University, Wayne State University, the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeals, then the two state ballot proposals, and then there are all your local races. For example, here in our area, we're in a voting on um, school boards as well as the community college, and that'll probably be true in most areas unless there's a vacancy in city government, which might also be on your ballot. And of course, then there's local ballot proposals. So this year, since a lot of elections have been combined in recent years, this ballot's pretty long. So some of the things that you would vote for in the past, maybe a, a school board election who serves on your local school board right. or, or some of the local city proposals, those have tended to be pushed to a, a November ballot like what's coming up. But I understand was legislation that was passed kind of encouraged everybody to consolidate elections, and this is the result. <laughs> it's a longer ballot, and hopefully more people will be involved in voting. Uh, why don't we switch gears just a little bit and, and go to you, Craig? And um, can can you talk briefly about the the whole ballot proposal initiative mm -hmm. uh, opportunities that are out there? And then specifically about the two items that are on the ballot for voters across the state of Michigan? Sure, sure. Um, w there's a number of ways that we can put questions on the ballot. Um, the, this instance here uh, in November, we're dealing with a referendum, and that's, that's one way of uh, affecting direct democracy in, in our state. Um, another way is the initiative process. 
Um, an still another way is by uh, constitutional amendment. Um, so let me start with the referendum process, which we're dealing with this time. The referendum is basically uh, citizens asking to have their say on a law that's been passed by you, uh, the legislature. Uh, this is a law that has passed both chambers of the, uh, the legislature, has been signed by the governor, and uh, citizens who might be in disagreement with the law collect enough signatures to uh, basically put that law up to a public vote. And the threshold for that number of signatures there is 5% of the uh, votes cast in the last gubernatorial election. So you, uh, petition circulators will collect uh, signatures across the state. Uh, once those signatures are certified, that law um, is put on hold. So it's temporarily put in limbo and it's not in effect until uh, the next general election at which time the entire state gets to vote on it. So that's the referendum. That's one way that we can have a question on the ballot. The other way is an initiative, and that's uh, the process by which citizens can act as legislators. They can draft legislation um, uh, and then go around the state and collect signatures that uh, people would be saying, I agree with this legislation. Um, the threshold there on the signature uh, requirement is 8% of the uh, votes cast in the last gubernatorial election. And so this, the citizens will collect those signatures, and once they're certified uh, by the state, the Secretary of State, the state's election official, then it goes to you, the legislature. And we kind of, in Michigan, we have an indirect initiative process. In some states, it's a direct initiative process where once those signatures are collected, they go directly to uh, a statewide vote. In this case, the legislature has an opportunity to uh, approve or disapprove that that legislation. If the legislature approves the the the, the legislation, that's really the end of the the story for that legislation. It uh, it doesn't have to go to the governor for signature. It becomes uh, effective uh, after the legislative session in which it was it was passed. Um, the legislature could amend that or disapprove it. And if they do that, then they have to offer up an alternative uh, on the same subject. And then both proposals, the one that came from the citizenry and then the one that came from the legislature, goes on that November ballot and uh, voters cast their, their ballot. And whichever one gets more votes is, is enacted as law, again, without the governor's signature. So the third way we can get a question on the ballot, and this is probably the one that people uh, might be most familiar with, and this is where uh, we want to amend our state constitution. Our state constitution is our fundamental law. It's where all of the powers of government are enumerated, and it's basically the people saying to the government, this is the powers we give you to govern. Um, and uh, that constitution uh, can be amended by a collection of signatures uh, as to an amendment. Uh, generally limited to one topic. So you can't have uh, an amendment that covers uh, the Bill of Rights, um, taxation, and universities all rolled up into one amendment. The amendment needs to address a single issue. And once the signatures are collected, sufficient signatures are collected for a constitutional amendment, it goes to the ballot where the, the voters will decide yay or nay if they want to uh, amend the state constitution. So those are the, the three main ways that we have uh, ballot questions in the state of Michigan. So, um, and we'll start with you, Craig. And, and so what is before us uh, this November is the referendum. And, and so there's two of them, and, and they have to do with wolf hunting. So, so could you, and I'd ask Judy to follow up, um, uh, but could you explain what the, the voters are going to be voting on, what the implications are of, of their, their vote? Sure, sure. Uh, you're right. We have uh, two referenda on this, on this ballot. They both deal with wolf hunting, which is uh, somewhat unusual to have uh, uh, basically the, the, the same issue, uh, two separate questions. So proposal one is a uh, referendum on a public act that was passed in 2012, Public Act 520, which went into the state's natural resources law and listed as a species that could be hunted in this state, uh, wolf. Um, so let me take a step back. Why, why are we putting wolf on the species list? Well, um, this was an endangered species for about half of a century. Um, uh, 
and uh, when it was on that endangered species list, it, it couldn't be hunted. And so the population of wolf, which numbered uh, hundreds, uh, 50, 100 years ago, uh, got smaller, that population. And their, their, the wolf's habitat is in the UP. And so they were put on the Nash, uh, federal endangered species list. The population grew. Um, scientists, uh, natural resource scientists decided that the population was strong enough that uh, we could uh, manage the population through hunting. It was removed from the uh, endangered species list in 2011 and uh, the authority to regulate the wolf in the state of Michigan was turned over to the state. Uh, and at that time, uh, people who wanted to uh, hunt the animal uh, approached the legislature about an idea to uh, put wolf on uh, the uh, listed uh, game species list and that legislation passed and that again that was Public Act 520 of 2012 and so uh, uh, people who were against wolf hunting um, exercising their right to uh, challenge that law collected signatures uh, in sufficient number to put a pause on that law and so that law was um, put on hold uh, in early 2013. Um, so this is where uh, we've described this as a little bit of a, a political chess match uh, between the pro-wolf hunting and the anti-wolf hunting uh, groups. And uh, so once that law was put on hold, the pro-wolf hunting groups decided, well, we could uh, propose a different law in the legislature whereby we give the authority to name game species to the National Natural Resources Commission. So instead of just putting the wolf on the list uh, as a game species, we would pass another law that gave the authority to name species to the Natural Resources Commission. So Public Act 21 of 2013 did just that. And did, did you want to weigh in? And sometimes people ask, and we put this in our voter guide, who's supporting it and who's opposing it. And those that are saying yes to vote for wolf hunting, they have a coalition called Citizens for Professional Wildlife Management. And one of the member organizations is the Michigan United Conservation Clubs. And then there's a group opposing it called Keep Michigan Wolves Protected. And the Humane Society is an example of a group in that coalition. Again, if you want to look on the website, you could probably find more information about both of those coalitions if it helps you gather more background information. So, uh, I, you know, I think it's real, I, I appreciate the, the explanation. And I think it's easy to say, okay, if you are supportive of, of allowing a, a wolf hunt or, or wolf hunting, uh, you vote uh, the one way in this in this case mm -hmm. um, you, you vote affirmative or yes on, on either of them and, and if you're opposed to it you, you vote no um, is there is there some sort of some substance or, or can we is there something else that um, in terms of um, the, the nature of the the issue or in terms of a concern about why we would want to uh, hunt wolves or, or not hunt, hunt wolves and again, I mean, that, that right. on its face, that's certainly what is in front of the voters. And, and um, I, I think that you, you, there's a good explanation of that. Mm -hmm. um, do, do you have some, some information that you guys provide that talks about some of the, the aspects of that, that would maybe support or, or maybe yeah. not support a wolf hunt? I'll take a crack at it. Um, the, the CRC has issued a, an analysis of the ballot mm -hmm. proposal and included in that analysis is not only the the history of how we got to this point of, of voting on it, but also a little background and a little discussion of the, of the issues involved. And I guess um, I, I can touch on a little bit of those. Again, we're not supporting a yes or a no vote, but sure. um, this is a UP issue. Um, uh, this is wolves, are, are, uh, their habitat is in the UP, and, and uh, the, the wolf hunt that took place was restricted to three areas in the UP, so not the entire UP. Um, wolves are a uh, pack animal. Um, they're predatory, um, so they, they hunt in packs. Um, there's some concern in the UP, which prompted the legislation to, to allow wolf hunting, that these animals were 
uh, threatening livestock in the state. Um, uh, with their growing populations, we're getting uh, too close to human uh, uh, populations and humans, uh, whether it's uh, residents or commercials. There was some concern that, you know, just the increase in the number of wolves and uh, they, they cover quite a bit of, 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 of land when they, when they roam, uh, they were coming in contact with humans. And there was some concern because they can be a dangerous, a dangerous animal. Um, so that was what prompted the calls for a wolf hunt. Um, the supporters of the wolf hunt will say, we don't want to eliminate the wolf. We want to manage the species. We want to make sure that um, there's not too many that uh, starvation and um, illness can happen in the pack, uh, but we also don't want too few that we result in putting the, the animal on the Endangered Species Act. So that's kind of the, the uh, pro-wolf hunting issue and what prompted it uh, to this point. The, the anti-side um, generally discusses the fact that wolves aren't hunted for um, their um, uh, for sustenance, human mm -hmm. sustenance, like uh, deer might be, or, uh, mm -hmm. or other animals, some wild uh, uh, waterfowl might be, uh, that they're, they're hunted primarily for trophy uh, purposes. Uh, the anti-wolf hunting uh, arguments are also that if it's livestock predation that we're worried about, we have laws in the books that compensate livestock owners if there's a wolf kill. If a, if, an, if a wolf kills a, a, an animal, a livestock animal, and so there's, there's indemnification in that, so that, that shouldn't be a concern. Um, and then also just the, the animal uh, is part of a, a larger uh, part of uh, the ecosystem shouldn't be taken out of its natural environment, and that would be one, another argument why we shouldn't be hunting those, the, the animals. So uh, again, uh, it's a UP issue. Um, uh, but all voters across the state are being asked to, to weigh in on this, this, this issue. Um, and uh, there's arguments uh, for the hunt and arguments against the hunt, and I would just suggest that you know, voters do their homework and see where their uh, personal beliefs and values lie. And did, did you have anything that you wanted to... There just um, is probably still some confusion since the legislature also dealt with initiative on this issue. And um, we're at the League of Women Voters is, even though the legislature did pass that initiative uh, on wolf hunting, which will impact the outcome on these two issues, we still think it's important for the voters to vote uh, and let our elected representatives know their position on wolf hunting, whether it's yes or no. Very good. Um, so maybe we can take a step back and, and think about um, other, other aspects of, of the, the referendum and initiative process. And um, do, you, do you either have, your organizations have any perspective on that in terms of the process that we have, in terms of the um, um, concerns that citizens might have with this process? I guess from uh, the League of Women Voters uh, viewpoint, the process is kind of, um, it's definitely allowable, but it's kind of changed in the last few years with not allowing voters to vote on as many issues, uh, with the legislature adding an appropriation, which means the voters can't vote, and it's uh, it's something that's happened. It's happened over time. It's just happened more recently, and it kind of removes the voters from having an input on important issues. Uh, so that's been of concern to our organization, and something we're following in the legislative process. So, so in the the Constitution, there's a right to referendum mm -hmm. in which the the voters can challenge a law that's been passed by the legislature and signed into uh, law by the, the governor, but that doesn't apply to every law? Right. Not so. if it <laughs> and I, I think we were kind of talking about a, an, another issue which isn't directly related to the vote uh, here in November on the two referendum, but we do have an initiated law which uh, proponents of wolf hunting, uh, this is the initiative process we talked about, uh, collected enough signatures to put a law before the legislature uh, last summer uh, to basically allow 
wolf hunting um, in the future, so beginning in 2015 and, and forward. Um, that law got the approval of both chambers of, of the legislature, and uh, it, was si it w didn't need to be signed by the governor, and it's going to take effect next, next spring. Uh, it includes an appropriation, and we have a provision in the Constitution that says any law that has an appropriation in it cannot be reviewed by the citizenry through a referendum. So that law, I'm kind of calling it a super law in that um, it didn't uh, go to the governor, so the governor couldn't veto it. And because it has a uh, appropriation in it, it can't be subject to referendum. And that is the scientific, the, the law is called the Scientific Fish Wildlife Conservation Act. And for all intents and purposes, it reenacts uh, Public Act 21, one of the laws that the voters are being asked to, to weigh in on. It reenacts that law in its entirety, and that's the law that would give the Natural Resources Commission the ability to, to name a species to the game list and then set a, a hunting season. Well, so the, the chess game goes on, and, <laughs> and um, unfortunately that's all about all, all the time that we have, and, and those are certainly interesting issues that, that uh, you both have raised and, and you know, certainly subjects of, of further discussion, but um, uh, very happy to have you both on, um, the, the League of Women Voters in Michigan and, and the Citizens Research Council. Um, you guys do great work, and this was about informing the voters of this November's ballot, and I think you've done a wonderful job of that. So thank you for appearing. Thank you. And uh, once again, um, I'm Hoon Young Hopgood, the state senator for the 8th District. Um, this has been the Hopgood Hour, and we've been talking about the November ballot and some of the things that will be appearing on the ballot and some of the things that voters will want to think about as they prepare themselves for exercising their rights. Um, as always, please feel free to contact my office with any questions or concerns that you may have regarding state government. And thank you for tuning in to another edition of the Hopgood Hour.